Hi, Jessica. Thank you so much for joining us today at Chick Chat. We're just honored that you're here with us today. Oh, Thank you. I'm super excited to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh my goodness. Of course. And I have to say before we get started, Jessica, congratulations on the birth of your second baby. Oh, How you. is life as a mom of two now? Well, the baby's the easy part, which <laughs> I, I feel like people had told me. They were like, if you have a good baby and Teddy, that's her name, is a great baby. And we had an amazing sleep trainer. Um, I'm very pro sleep training, um, which I could talk about for hours. Um, but everyone said, if the baby is good, it's really going to be the toddler. That's your huh. problem. And the toddler is a hellscape. <laughs> Adorable. How? Love her. And she loves the baby, at least. There's no like trying to flush huh. her you know, down the toilet or the bath or like a friend of mine told me that her toddler had been bouncing her, the baby in the bouncer, like really yeah. hard to try to catapult her <laughs> out of it. So I haven't had any of that, no violent attacks, but the sleep schedule is horrendous now for the older one. But um, yeah. Oh, because they're like, what's going on? This is a whole new yeah. change for everybody. So this is a lot of fun. And you're like, wait a minute, hold on. Um, but I'm so glad that things are going really well with the new baby and you're yeah. getting hopefully some sleep because, yes, At obviously. Weird times. <laughs> yeah. <weird> times. <laughs> because times. obviously having such a demanding yet wonderful career, you need to get as much sleep as you possibly can. So, oh my goodness. I mean, the Fox – makeup artists are <laughs> champions so they can make any under eye situation look like you're fresh and dewy but uh -huh. uh, it's tough you just like wake up and you're like whose little limb is on me and like <laughs> she also thinks that my husband her father is like her boyfriend now she's like we do everything together because I'm more bound to the baby. So when I get really riled up, I'll say to her like, you know, daddy was my boyfriend before he was your dad. And she gets so offended because she just figured <laughs> out what girlfriend boyfriend is. So uh, it's lively. But yes, uh, sleep oh. is necessary. Water seems oh. to be the key to solving all problems. So drinking yes. a lot of water. Oh, I'm so glad. Oh my goodness. Well, yeah. I'm congratulations again. Thank and you. before we get started on this topic of navigating a wonderful yet demanding career during pregnancy and early motherhood, we'd love to learn more about you, Jessica. So please tell us about yourself, your background, and how you ended up where you are today. Okay. Um, so I grew up in New York City, a lifelong New Yorker, except for school. Um, so I went to college outside of Philadelphia. I went to all women's college, which I would I love talking about as well how important I think single sex education can be at any stage of your life, um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Anyway, I did a year abroad in London uh, at the London School of Economics during college, and then I went back for grad school. After college, I did my PhD at the London School of Economics in the government department. I was looking at the impact of originally I wanted to do political apologies and focus on how political apologies could sink or swim a politician. There weren't enough examples for me uh, to do that. So I started looking at the impact of political scandal on politicians, which is very apt uh, for the American scene now as well. Um, did my PhD, did my first campaign, political campaign over in London, uh, the mayoral re-election of Boris Johnson, who went on to be the prime minister. Um, in the UK. And then I moved home and started working for a political pollster. And that's kind of what set me on my trajectory heading towards Fox. So I was working for a guy named Doug Schoen, who was Bill Clinton's pollster in the 1990s. <clears throat> and he was the guy that figured out that soccer moms or the national security moms were going to be the key constituency for Clinton's reelection in 96. So I started working for him and Mike Bloomberg the former mayor of New York City was a main client. So doing things like gun control and soda bans and looking at charter schools and all of these really meaty political topics that I absolutely loved were our focus. And as I was growing uh, within the organization and kind of, I don't know if you had this experience, but I'm sure you've definitely heard about it. Like when you're working for someone who you can never become, you have to find other ways to build your brand. And Doug, my boss, was really cognizant of that. And so he started pushing me towards 
going on air. And he was a contributor at Fox. And so he kind of pulled some strings and said, like, give her a shot, let her come on and chat about news of the day, whatever's going on. And that started it in 2015, 2016. And it was a great fit. And I got hired in 2017, formally, right after um, Hillary Clinton sadly lost the presidential election. And I've been there ever since and been a co-host of The Five for about two and a half years now. Oh, my gosh. Not busy whatsoever. Oh, my (laughs) But that's amazing. Yeah. It was a lot. A lot going on. But all really fun. And I loved every stage. And every stage, I thought I would do something else. You know, you you never predict exactly where you're going to end up. So you're like, oh, I'm here. So I'm obviously going to do this. And then it's like, oh, no, actually, I'm not at all. Um, Just kidding. Yeah. (laughs) Just kidding. That is so cool. How? What was it that made you become so passionate about political science? I always find politics interesting, but just really as someone that would take in the news. I grew up in a household of very um, politically aware parents. Um, they were, you know, out there protesting the Vietnam War. My mom was really active kind of in the women's revolution, like not actually burning her bra, but, you know, getting as close as possible. Um, So that was something that was ever present in the house. And then I think, so I'm a 1984 baby. Um, So the Clinton administration, I was like loosely aware, but then I think with a lot of elder millennials, Iraq and Afghanistan kind of electrified you and that you started paying attention in a completely different way and started to understand more about the different ways that you can make an impact, right? That it isn't just necessarily everyone in Washington that's getting things done. And obviously that's a big deal and a a career in public service, but actually how much people on the outside, people who work in the private sector, people who are volunteers, people who are galvanizing people to get out to vote, all of those things started to become more present in my life um, before Obama was elected in 08, which was then just like this watershed um, for our generation. I'm, I'm, I feel like we're basically the same age. I'm just going to treat you that way. We are. Um, yeah, great. <laughs> okay. Are. So you, you know what I'm talking about. It was like, totally. a, yes. like a switch flipped. Yeah. And it, it was like, I, I am part of something. I don't yeah. know what role I'm going to play in this, but mm-hmm. I feel – a part of something. And I was abroad actually when Obama got elected and living in London. Yeah. And it felt as jubilant as it did at home for people. And that was something so exciting to me to really see the impact of what we're doing at home in the U.S. on the international order. And it contextualized everything for me. And I just kind of got the bug and thought, I really want to be around this and so have ended cool. up in a, a strange way of being around it. But I would say that that was the path. <laughs> strange, but very like, wow, how uh, like amazing. And you're right. How you're saying you think you're going to end up one one direction and it, nope, just something else. But it all works out, I think, the way it should. And it has for you. So that's amazing. And now as a mom, oh my gosh, how has motherhood changed your perspective on the world? Well, much to the chagrin of a lot of my colleagues, it has not made me more conservative. They keep telling me like, oh, you'll go through this or this will happen and you'll pop out more conservative. Um, Not yet. Uh, I haven't become a senior citizen, though, and had someone try to take away my my Medicare and my Social Security. So Um, but it's been I, I think that, well, I guess two things. One, I think it's just made me a more complete person to have these people that I love in such a, a different way than I love every everyone else who's come through my life. And obviously, you know, my husband as someone that I am in love with, but as a father, that relationship has evolved too. But you really do understand the meaning of this is, these are the permanent things in my life. Like Cleo mm-hmm. and Teddy are it, right? Other, yeah. other relationships come and go. Um, but for as long as we're all on this earth together, you, this is my priority. This is my heart. This is the light of my life. And that's been really cool to experience. I have great relationships with my parents. Um, my father passed away in 2021, um, but we were incredibly close. And my mom lives a 10 minute walk from here. And uh, she's just the best um, and has navigated motherhood and her 
their marriage was something that I always really looked up to. And now she's in this incredible new phase of life where I actually feel like I have another child. Like I have like a 71 year old child also (laughs) who's kind of finding her feet, you know, like a little duckling out there in the world. Um, So that's been really interesting and watching her as well get to have that relationship with my daughters has been hugely special. So motherhood, motherhood has just been really incredible. You just tapping into resources of love and affection that you didn't know that you had um, and trying to figure out actually what the rest of your life is going to look like. Because all of these things that we were doing before they got here gets turned on its head or you realize it's not going to work and and that's going to keep evolving anyway. I'm, I'm sure you're very familiar with the oh my God, where are we going to live? Where's the best place to live to raise kids? What's the best place yes. for me? And then I just keep thinking, like, I have no idea who they're going to be. Like, it's Olympics time right now. Like, maybe we're going to have to live closer to a great pool facility because <laughs> they're going to be Katie Ledecky or like, they're way too big to be Simone Biles. But you realize that your life is going to be taken over by whatever it is that they are passionate about. Um, so mm-hmm. making room for that um, and also earning enough money to support all of this. It's the most expensive endeavor I've ever imagined. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a very convoluted answer, but it's great. I love my kids. <laughs> no, this was a great answer. It's just completely covering all bases. And it's so true. You couldn't imagine what, how was life, how did I live life without these human beings? What was, what was I doing? How was I tired? And now I couldn't oh. imagine life being <laughs> any different, you know? Yeah. It's weird. Also, when you like take a vacation, we went away <laughs> the last week of maternity leave. My friend was getting married abroad. Um, and so we went away for a week without either of the girls. Yeah. And I realized that you. even- yeah, that, that well, it also just would have been horrendous. And they yeah. weren't invited to the wedding and whatever, all the yeah. things. But we really all wanted to go away. So we yeah. did. And then I realized that I spent the whole time like trying to figure out good times to FaceTime them. And my two year old was busier than I am. You know, you're like ducking into the corner of a museum or you're like calling them from an airport. Um, so, yes, it's a, a complete and total takeover of everything. <laughs> everything. It's yeah. so true. It rocks your world in the weirdest but best way possible. <laughs> totally. Oh yeah. And Jessica, you've managed to maintain a significant presence in the public eye while navigating pregnancy and early motherhood. Can you share some of the strategies you use to really balance public attention with your privacy during these personal times? Yeah, so I'm not great at being a private person. Uh, my, Me too. I get uh, it. <laughs> yeah, my it, my husband hates it, and we it, he's so private. Like, I don't know things about him that definitely you know. What, so when we were gonna get married, we had to have that interview. I don't know mm. to, if you guys did this right to make sure that you actually know how he takes his coffee or whatever. I basically knew nothing about him, and we met the week before COVID. It, like, it's a very strange circumstance. We were next door neighbors, but had never met. And then we were shut in together. So we were like, well, I guess we should just get pregnant. We're of a certain age. And so I really, I didn't know what he was like outside the house, basically, you know, who he was before all of this. And we're sitting in that interview and I'm looking at him because it's over Zoom and he's next to me and I'm completely panicked. And the woman, yeah. she was very sweet from City Hall said like, I'm fairly confident this is legit. Like, you don't have to be this panicked about it. Um, But part of that is how private he is. And he just randomly ended up with this wife who's quite in the public eye. And so- Opposites attract. That, like, happens, right? (laughs) I I mean, I'm hoping so because I don't want to get divorced. (laughs) But (laughs) it's definitely not a pairing that either of us envisioned in that sense. And so I think that I have been much more reserved- Mm-hmm. And how much of my family life has been made public because he doesn't have the constitution for it. And mm-hmm. I actually, I don't have social media besides a Twitter account or an X right. account, X, uh, yeah. which I, yeah, which I only started for work purposes. Right. Um, I actually had a very funny conversation with Sean Hannity, who is a primetime host at Fox. And he said, like, you have nothing. Like when I was starting out and I said, no, I think it's all really dysfunctional and terrible. And I'll just spend my whole life looking at 
pictures of my ex-boyfriends or whatever it is. And he said, well, you really, you need it so that people can feel that they have a way to access you, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have an ex account, but no Instagram, no TikTok, none of that. Um, So that does make it easier in terms of keeping the public profile of everything down. And my sister will just send me links to stuff. She's like, hey, did you know that you're trending audio on TikTok? And I'm like, no, thanks for letting me know. (laughs) Um, So I try to be as responsible about it as Mm -hmm. possible. Um, I'm aware of the fact that because I'm also working at a conservative network and I'm a liberal, that it does invite a lot more criticism and kind of negativity than it would if I was at an MSNBC or a CNN where more people agreed with me. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I get a lot of very hostile outreach over X. I've had, you know, pretty nasty letters and things like that mailed to the office. Um, So I'm pretty cognizant of it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a, well, thank you. That's not a really- How do you, like, how do you, you know tell me that, that I look great or something? That? Yeah. Uh, well, security mostly handles it. They like, you know, they sweep everything. Yeah, but mentally, they, emotionally, um, like how do you handle that? I have, I guess, developed really thick skin about it. It doesn't bother me. I think that if someone Good. threatened my family- That's the thing that I'm most afraid of getting to that phase in life. And as a society, I think that's just becoming more and more prevalent. I mean, Mm -hmm. at least you see that with people who are in political orbits, that there are those kinds of threats um, that would really kill me. Um, Mm -hmm. But I just try to be as smart about it as possible. And it was interesting when I was interviewing nannies, uh, the nanny that we ended up with randomly had also worked for someone else who worked in cable news. And she was telling me about all of these things that this other woman had done, like putting air tags on the kids um, that she had to update every time they were moving locations. Um, And I had never even thought about all of this. I, you know, and I grew up in New York city. It wasn't like little house on the prairie or anything, but I, it had never occurred to me. And she said, well, especially if, they've seen pictures, if someone has seen pictures of your kids, it may, you should be a bit safer about it. And I hadn't considered it and obviously really appreciated that she had come to me with that suggestion. So I, I do tend to, to pay a good amount of attention just to like where they're going, that we're always in safe neighborhoods. And I, I happen to live in a great neighborhood, which is wonderful. Um, but I'm very cognizant of it. And I, I share, I do share pictures on the five. We do a little segment at the end called one more thing. Um, and I'll show off the girls, uh, that way, but I don't, I don't, I try not to expose them that much. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the balance, honestly, is to not share too much because you're right. It sometimes can just bite you in the butt having to be on social media a lot. Yeah. Well, it can be, it can be a it. lot. Yeah. It's, and you're right. You, you can't please I feel, I want to say you can't please everybody, but sometimes it feels like you can't please anybody <laughs> because there's always an opinion about something. And, and when it comes to becoming a, once you're pregnant and you become a mother, it's just a different level of where your thoughts go and how you have to protect yourself oh. and your family. And so that I think is just not sharing as much and being mindful of where you're at, who you're with. Um, and I think you're right. That's that's the balance, right? Totally. And I, I was just talking to my best friend about this yesterday, actually. Uh, she has a friend who's going through pretty rough fertility struggles and is now, you know, more towards mid forties and is thinking about giving up. And we were talking about, you know, the state of her relationship and like armchair quarterbacking this thing, right. You know, like, Oh, well, you know, I, I saw them at a dinner party and I didn't think they seemed that close and blah, blah, blah. And then we just said, you know, when it comes to anything related to getting pregnant, being pregnant, raising a child, any of it, a delivery, no judgment. I, I just, whatever people want to do with this incredibly difficult phase in your life or ex- set of experiences, hats off to you. If you ask my opinion, I'm happy to give it to you. But I just, the amount of judgment that swirls around mm-hmm. about how parents 
do things, uh, it's intolerable to me. And you just, you can't know what's going on in anyone's household, in anyone's mind. I mean, the amount of postpartum cases that aren't diagnosed, you know, I'll be sitting with someone where I'm fairly confident that they are (laughs) in the midst of a huge postpartum attack or phase of their lives, whatever the right terminology is. And you're just like, what can you do? You know, unless you're invited in. So yes, uh, just mind your own lane, I guess, exactly. is how I try to live with it. And I hope I'm making the right decisions, but cognizant of the fact that it's possible that I'm not. But that's what we're all going through. You know, as moms, we're all learning along the way and finding the people that we feel safe with that can help us through each phase of pregnancy, postpartum, and motherhood. So I think you're doing an awesome job. So, oh, And how do you decide what aspects of your pregnancy and early motherhood you're comfortable with sharing with the public and what you choose to keep private? So I went with both pregnancies a really long time before even saying I was pregnant. The way the five is set up, we have a table uh, mm-hmm. that we sit behind and I – I'm thankfully like not on a corner so no one can see the side frame and I'm 5'11 so I don't really look pregnant until oh, like 18 I, to 22 weeks. So jealous. As the girl here who's 5'2 who's like oh. six weeks pregnant and I already look pregnant like Jessica yeah. it's not fair. <laughs> I genuinely feel sorry for you. I never actually want to be small, but I especially don't want to be small pregnant because it's a complete takeover no, of your it whole body. Yes. Um, it's very cute though, like when you guys are waddling around. And- <gasps> that is a really sweet way to put it because yeah. it is not so cute in my opinion. I'm like, I am a bowling ball. Just roll me up and push me. It's just what it is. <laughs> it's honestly insane that we do this, that we like make people carry them around in our stomachs, get them out somehow, and then are expected also to look normal again afterwards, um, right. which I'm sure we'll get to. But uh, so I was never, I was very paranoid throughout my pregnancy that something would be wrong. So every marker, you know, I had friends who would get a positive pregnancy test and immediately tell everybody. I didn't tell anyone until 12 weeks, like once I get got the chromosomal test back that everything was fine. And I did genetic testing before I got pregnant as well, but I married a non-Jew, so he doesn't have any problems. It's crazy how many issues Ashkenazi Jews have. And then if you if you marry out of the tribe, you don't end up having uh, problems usually. Uh, so 12 weeks before I even told anyone, then you know I want the anatomy scan. So that's 16 weeks and 20 weeks. And then viability markers at 24 weeks. So I really, I would have gone forever (laughs) if I could without telling uh, people and the table at work really helped me out. Um, So I basically, I like to infuse it in my commentary because I do think it changes my perspective on issues. And especially now with how important the conversations around women's reproductive health is, I think that it's really crucial to actually have a mother's point of view on this. And obviously your podcast isn't political, so I'm not going to go into my whole spiel about it. But a majority of women who are having abortions are women who have had kids before. Like They're people who it's part of family planning. And to bring that kind of perspective to the table on the five and to talk about it, you know, all across Fox programming, you know, whenever I'm booked and showing up was something that's really important. And I think that there was also tremendous power in advocating for a woman's right to choose sitting there eight months pregnant. Like this isn't about me wanting to be able to have an abortion. I chose this. I want this Mm -hmm. child. She is going to be coming into a loving household. We have the means to take care of her, which is one of the main reasons that people even consider getting an abortion. It is, like I said, hugely expensive to have a kid um, and to to see all that through. And so I did, once it became public that I was pregnant, I did, I don't want to say I used it, but it became part of my rhetoric, part of the way that I was talking about the political climate. And I think in the post Dobbs decision world, that that's something important that women in in these kinds of positions can do. So I would talk about it. Um, Definitely not like 
every day, but it would be part of something. And because The Five is such a personality driven show and everyone knows each other so well and is enmeshed in our personal lives, like Dana Perino and her dogs, Judge Pirro has a grandson that's around the same age as Cleo. My my older daughter, Jesse Waters, has four kids. He has two tiny ones now. You know, it's all part of how we talk about these things. And so I decided to just lean into it, not something that I wanted to use as a crutch or to get, you know, special treatment for anything, um, but just like this is the biggest thing that could be going on in your life. And so once it was public, it's going to be out front that, yeah. that it's part of this. Yeah, it's part of your story. I mean, it's a huge part of any woman's story uh, <laughs> once they're pregnant. And and that's wonderful that everyone respected and didn't leak that information until you were ready. Because, yeah. you know, if you well, can actually, obviously see, uh, like, if you're me, <laughs> they're like, there's no hiding this. Sorry, girlfriend. <laughs> well, my co-host, Dana Perino, with my first pregnancy, she thought it was public already. And she revealed it on air for the first time. And oh. I, I, I am rarely at a loss for words. And I was like, oh my God. And so then I just went like, I'm pregnant. And she was mortified. It was so cute. And she's the best intentioned person. So it was, yes. you know, pure accident um, and was actually nice because there was no pressure on it then because I had been thinking like, oh, how am I going to say that I'm pregnant? And then Dana just did it for me. So <laughs> there you go. Take the pressure yeah. off. Thank you, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, Jessica. So reflecting on your experiences, how important have your support systems been, both personal and professional, in helping you navigate this period of motherhood? Like, can you provide some examples of how these support systems have made a difference and which ones moms should consider if they have also a demanding career and are a new mom? Yeah, well, I've been really lucky to live so close to my mom. Um, oh, she's not that is gold. I love that. Seriously. It is. And it's so weird. It's like overnight you go from, oh my God, family's so annoying to, <laughs> oh, I just don't care if there are 9 million people in my house all the time, if they're going to hold my baby or if I can go take a nap. Um, so just having my mom around and we joke with her that if we were going to do her online dating profile again, she actually, she went online and she met a very nice guy. She has a great boyfriend, uh, but that her tagline, you know, would be not that kind of grandma because she's the one who's like, oh, you know, Teddy pooped and like hands her back to you, you know, but just having her presence around and she loves being with them. It's like this calming force that you kind of, you get through all of this and you're not the first one to do it, obviously. No one's reinventing the wheel. And so there's this level of calm. Um, so support system in family and Brian, my husband's family, they live down the Jersey Shore, so about an hour and a half away. Um, but they're also fantastic. Another grandma that's not that kind of grandma, but the key to everything is amazing nannies, caregivers, whatever it is. And I don't know if you saw this, you... Do you remember the acceptance speech that Melanie Linsky, the actress, uh, she was on that show? Well, actually, it's probably still running for a third season, but it was called Yellow Jackets. Anyway, she won an award for it. And in her acceptance speech, she just talked about her nanny and how her <laughs> nanny had facilitated an environment in which she could professionally thrive and still know that her daughter, I think they have a daughter, was well taken care of. And so the support system of the nanny is mm -hmm. so crucial. And Angie, who is our nanny, is our older daughter's best friend. And I'm sure at some point, Teddy, the baby, will think that she's her mom. Um, and I'm going to be much more comfortable with it this time around than I was the first time I was rejected uh, for the nanny. So that's all very important. Um, and I guess this is now the third time I'm I'm mentioning the money aspect of all of this. It is so expensive to be able to have kids and keep your job. Um, and I know a lot of women especially struggle with the, mo the money of it all, right? If I'm not earning enough to counteract the cost of what daycare is or to hire someone to be in your home to take care of them. And then when you get it to adding school costs, et cetera, that it might not work out for them. Um, so I've been 
really lucky to be able to have somebody. Um, but help is a huge, huge part of that. And then professionally speaking, um, Fox is just the most pro family place. So I, we have a female CEO in Suzanne Scott, um, and she is always prioritized family for us. I actually got promoted while I was on maternity leave, which never happens. Yeah. Who does that? I love that. (laughs) I had a meeting with her before I went out on leave just basically so she could reassure me that I would have a job when I got back, which also doesn't happen. The amount of women that I know that are in complete state of panic are cutting their maternity leave short because they want to get back to make sure that, you know, they're not going to lose their jobs. They're not going to be replaced by whoever their Mac cover is, et cetera. Um, so I had that and then I got promoted while I was out. Um, so it's a really special place for people who have families. And it's something that's really built into the ethos of everything. Like folks have their kids at work all the time when we travel. Like we were just at the RNC in Milwaukee. People had their kids there. People had their spouses there. You know, it's this understanding that your work life obviously matters, um, but it's your home life that makes you complete and makes you also achieve and perform at the level that they want you to. Right. Like if you're miserable at home, you're not going to be that good on TV. So, um, the, but it's it's so hard because you know I've had this amazing story when it comes to an employer that's so positive about having a family and so pro family as a corporation. But no one, you're not going to say to someone like, "Well, you should go out, you should quit your job, and you should go work somewhere else that's going to be more accommodating to this." And I right. understand that most women don't get that, and sometimes I find myself at a loss. The stories that I hear about the ways that maternity leave is chopped into or that uh, paid family leave in general, like the amount of men now who do want to be taking it, but are not, you know, it's one of these unspoken things. Like you're technically entitled to this and maybe it's like four weeks or it's six weeks. Um, But we don't look that fondly upon it. And that's still very much the case. Like in finance, um, my husband works in finance and there's he says most firms, there's no set policy. And the idea is unless it's kind of the first few days after the baby's born, if you're not reachable, they're pissed. Um, so. Which is like, what? D- have those people had babies before? Have they supported their wives and those babies <laughs> before? Because what the heck? Yeah. I mean, it's it's just the way that it is that it is. And so there, when I heard these, you know, these stats about how much better everything is getting, like all of this can be true and it can also still be true that it's still terrible. Oh yeah. We still have a long way to go. We're making baby steps, but we got a long way to go. Little baby chick steps. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So support systems, hugely important. And also, and we touch on this a little bit with the postpartum stuff, but like that you're right in the head. Um, and feeling yes. physically good is such a core component of it because there's no I mean, you're your first line of defense for everything. So your body has gone through a trauma mm. of epic proportions and working on your own health and that you're feeling kind of sane and good <laughs> about everything is probably the first thing that I should have mentioned in terms of a support system. But I appreciate you mentioning it at all because that is, you're right, definitely something that we have to keep in mind because I think that when we're pregnant, we focus so much on a healthy pregnancy, as we should, and having a healthy birth, which is great, yes, yeah, and not really thinking too much about life after and other than the cute nursery, my baby registry, that sort of thing. And making sure, do I have the support systems lined up for me to thrive and for my baby to thrive? Because if I'm not thriving, no one's thriving. Like that's just how it is. As the mother, you are the heart and the foundation of that home. And we need a happy, healthy mom to really, I think, in my opinion, have a thriving family. And so if you can prepare and think about these things that Jessica just said, when you're pregnant, you are setting yourself up for so much more success for when you do have your baby. Because, oh my goodness, after I had my second, I 
told my my mother, my mother-in-law, my aunt, I was like, okay, so you're coming for two weeks, you're coming for a week, then yeah. you're coming for a week, and then you're coming back for two more weeks. <laughs> and I made sure I had, you know, six, seven weeks of, of someone in my house. Yes, to help. Because as as a self-employed person, I don't get maternity leave. So right. I'm like, I I need this help like stat right now. Um, so so thinking about these things, even and maternity leave is wonderful, but gosh, women don't have enough of it here in the States. No. And so you really need to take this time during your pregnancy to be thinking about these things of like, okay, do I have someone to talk to for my mental health to check in if I'm not feeling okay? Is this really just the blues or is it a little something more? Is this postpartum depression, anxiety, OCD? What is this that I'm feeling? How can I get myself feeling better? What support systems can I put in place? But thinking about these things before they happen, because once you have a baby, oh my gosh, you are so tired and trying to find those resources at that point, you're already, your hormones are all over the place. Yes, your yeah. hormones were all over the place during pregnancy, but you're a little bit more lucid. <laughs> you know? So, so I know I appreciate you talking about all of these things because I hope for our listeners, these things that you just said, Jessica, being mindful of them when you're pregnant and setting them up if you can, yeah. saying, hey, mom, can you stay over, you know, for X amount of time? And I, it's so true. Oh my gosh, what is it that we're like, okay, bye, parents, family, you're annoying. But as soon as you have a baby, it's like, oh, I will move across the street from you. Like, oh, no problem. Totally. <laughs> yep. I I I love my in-laws, but like I've never loved them so hard. Right. When you're like, <laughs> oh, you can come and you'll like stay in a hotel nearby and you'll come back tomorrow and do this. Yeah. Or yes. like I was away at the RNC, which I mentioned. And the kids went down to Brian's mother's house and the nanny went to, which was perfect because she could kind of like do everything and they could just like, you know, throw them in the pool. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a totally different world. Uh, totally. how you feel about your your space and your <laughs> privacy. Yeah, because I mean, I'm sorry. Once you have all these strangers looking at your body giving birth to a baby, you're like, it's just, come on in. Who cares? Oh, I'm like, in the Nine of us robe. in the shower, totally fine. Like, I, w what is peeing alone? What, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that luxury. Oh my goodness, it's the little yeah. things. Oh my gosh. Jessica, oh, so true. So... Gosh, have you found any particular strategies or practices that really help you stay organized or maintain productivity while adapting to this new life of being a mom? I think it's probably the support system stuff again yeah. and really like having a great caregiver. I'm not good with a schedule. I've noticed that like I have one and I'll look right. at it and it's just not updated properly. I'm not building in like travel time and things that you really need to. And so knowing that there's somebody who's going to be doing this block of time mm -hmm. and their, that their job is the kids makes such a huge difference for me. Um, I think we already said, you know, that you're not really taking a break, but making sure that you like go out to dinner every once in a while without them, um, even mm -hmm. if all you're doing is talking about them. Uh, it's totally fine, but just having a couple hours where you get out of the zone, mm -hmm. I think until you do that or in those moments when I go and do that, I realize kind of how not low in that I feel depressed, but just like low energy I get from being in the house all the time that yes. you're confined to this space. And it's so weird because with little kids, they thrive on routine and yes. you want to give that to them, right? Like that they know I'm going to get my bath and then I'm going to get my milk and then we're going to do three stories and then we're going to turn on my sound machine and then we're going to grab milk, you know, like whatever their little toy is and then I'll get in bed. And as an adult and someone who grew up and has always lived in big thriving cities, I love unpredictability. I love that you walk out of your, ha you know, the door and – you know, lower Manhattan and you could see anyone, right? Like, is that Nathan Lane having a pancake or whatever <laughs> it's going to be? 
that's probably such a weird reference of one. He lives in the neighborhood. So I see Nathan Lane all the time and there's a pancake place uh, right outside my house. Um, and I love that, but it's not actually what's good for kids. And right. that adjustment has been hard, you know, because mm-hmm. the, mm-hmm. the nights when you're like, let's just go out and they have this amazing time and your toddler's like in chicken tender heaven and there's infinite French fries and they have coloring stuff at the restaurant and everything is great. And then we come home and it is a misery. She's like, thinks that she's now going to be in bed with us and watch trolls and never go to sleep. And you're like, I should have just given you mac and cheese here and done the routine yeah. the same way, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's kind of like that thing that's trending on social media right now. It's like, no, I, I haven't stopped doing like what we love. It's just now ruined. Like we bring our kids. It's just now ruined. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, yes, it's great to be able to go out and have those spontaneous moments, but it's so true when we're mixing things up and their routine that they're not used to, yeah. it can be overstimulating for them and they can have tantrums and that's normal with their development. Right. But then we're just like, oh yeah, that's right. I'm a parent. Like <laughs> this is going to be well, a little like, different. <laughs> what do they say that uh, vacation is just an away game? Yeah, without exactly. all the equipment, <laughs> you know, yeah. or you're like, I'm going to a hotel. It's going to be so great. It'll be romantic. Like maybe we'll do it. And then you're like, no, actually, absolutely not. All I want to do is take a really great shower and have no one touch me yes. in here. And there will be a kid in here by 5 a.m. anyway. So. <laughs> So true. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Jessica. Oh, I love it. Oh. And now looking back, I want to know what is like that one piece of advice you wish you had received before becoming a mother? That I wish I would have received. Um I think I wish that more people had told me how terrible you're going to physically feel. Like, I think it's something. <laughs> well, I'm not someone that I, I didn't feel like I was glowing or, and I think part right. of that is also being pregnant on TV is not, even if you're 5'11", you can't see a lot of it. Like when I look back at clips from then or pictures of me, like I think I look disgusting and that's something really hard just to enjoy. No. And I get it. You're doing like the great woman thing where you're like, you're crazy. You are beautiful. You're, you know, you're a goddess. You made children, you know, but we all feel crappy about how we look. And I think that people will, even your really great friends will just say that everything is normal. Like, oh, you know, I was so exhausted or I felt so terrible. I'm, you know, I could barely get up to do this. I could barely take a shower, whatever it is. And I wish that it had been made more serious a message because I had moments where I was so tired that I thought I was going to die. I thought like, well, this is what it's like right before you go, (laughs) you know, and or maybe there is something more wrong with me, right, than I'm just completely exhausted by all of this. And that wasn't made, I think, clear enough to me that those feelings of like how kind of dark it can get and how exhausted and and dirty and lonely and all of that is actually totally normal. Yeah. You know, and I, I know that people, especially who have struggled with fertility issues, will say like, we, you know, we live in a society that allegedly talks about all these issues all the time, but it's not enough, right? It, I actually didn't know where to go when we couldn't get pregnant, or I didn't know what to do when I couldn't figure out the stupid ovulation sticks, or I thought that I was counting wrong, and it turns out that, you know, one of my ovaries doesn't operate properly. Like all of these things that for this pro-woman society that we're living in right now where it's all rah, 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 and you can do everything, the people still largely feel alone. Um, And I guess that's, I should have led with that, that there's a loneliness to it as your family's getting bigger, which feels counterintuitive. But that's something that I definitely felt like no one understands me. And I didn't feel that I had gotten the full rundown of 
how insane this experience is. Yeah. And if you had known that before you were having a baby, would you have believed it? What would you would what would have happened? I would have, yeah, I think I would have believed it. I think I would have just I mean, I'm obviously quite forthcoming with things. Um so I'm not sure that I would have necessarily talked about it more, but I think I could have prepared myself a bit better. I think I could have prepared my husband a bit better mm-hmm. because I think it's – and he's great and super hands-on dad and all of it. But, you know, they're not prepared for this at all because they can't even – like when you're trying to explain even what's going on in your body, like the amount of times that I wake him up and be like the cramp in my calf is the end <laughs> of the world. This is what it feels like. <laughs> I am going to die now. So I just wanted to say goodbye. And he's very sweet and would always try to massage it out. But, you know, they're they're, they're even more disconnected from the experience because they haven't made the thing, right? Like they didn't cook it. They didn't get it out. Um, So even like the best dads or partners, whoever your partner is, uh, don't know. Yeah. So I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it would have made a difference, but I wish that I could have known more about what it would feel like Yeah, if it's possible. I, no, I appreciate that. And for our listeners, if you were having those crazy pregnancy mm. leg cramps, please talk to your provider about getting on magnesium and calcium because that can really help. So there you go. <laughs> and then Jessica, how do you prioritize self-care? I feel like With everything you just said, with all that you do, but you're also saying, oh, yes, mental health, taking care of you is so important, which we absolutely agree. So how do you prioritize that self-care and mental well-being while juggling the demands of your career and new motherhood? I fit a lot into weird times during the day. Um, So like if you want to pop in and get like a facial or something like that, um, you can do it. I know a lot of people, especially in the the Zoom, like the, it's kind of weird. It's like the post-pandemic Zoom world mm-hmm. that it's easy now and like with telehealth to be able to talk to a therapist or someone, you know, even if you do it irregularly. Um, I had from for my pregnancies and then in postpartum, a trainer that specializes in uh, prenatal and postnatal training. So like really focused on your core so that you don't, what's it called? Like the diastasis recti so that your yep. body doesn't split open. So that's something that I really prioritize. I'm not someone that was running around in bikinis or wanted to again, but <clears throat> the idea that my body was actually going to completely separate really freaked me out. Um, so I make sure that that's something that just has to get done. And like, I know that there are a lot of parents out there specifically that will kind of color coordinate their calendars so that they can't, some things can't be overridden. Like you can't have a meeting that comes on, but then some things for themselves or that have to do with their kids, um, can be overridden, but if it's like an emergency and I make sure to treat everything like it's an emergency, like nothing that is, that has made it onto my calendar is actually up for negotiation. So I try, I try to do that, um, for self-care, but you know, I could use, I should go to sleep earlier, but it's really like the nighttime that I find is the most helpful to have. Like, even if I'm just doom scrolling Twitter, or watching some mindless thing on Netflix. Um, Because it's your you time. That's what so many mothers go through. Yes, yes. So... That's it. And those are really boring answers. But no, I lo- but that's that, no, no, no. Because I think that that's also just reiterating you need to schedule it. You just said that. Yeah. Putting that in your schedule, act as if this is emergency. No, nothing can override this. I have to put this time in for myself. I'm the same way. I literally have on my schedule lunch. So no one can <laughs> yeah. interrupt me during my lunch. And then I also have like putting the kids to bed doing self-care, preparing for for the next day, go to bed. So I have it all in my schedule and it notifies me on my phone because it's like, hey, girlfriend, I know that you're just like scrolling right now. Turn that off. You shouldn't be looking at that for an hour before bed. It's not important right now. Like, how about you like go do a hair mask real quick and just take a breath, you know? (laughs) Totally. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, you probably don't even do it every time you get the alert, but yes. Oh, but at least it's there and it, you know, reminds yeah. you because just relying on yourself to do it because as a mom, our to-do lists are just forever long, it feels like. So, yeah. you know, and that's why I wanted to know with your busy schedule and new motherhood, what was it that helped you? So that's, that's good. And like in those moments when you just feel overwhelmed, what are some of the strategies or support mechanisms you turn to for relief and balance? I cry a lot. I really <laughs> Me too. No, like in a, in a catharsis way, like in an intentional, you know that moment where you can decide to not cry about yeah. certain things. And obviously some of it is just it has to happen. But those kind of in-between moments where you're like I could go this way or I could go that way, I always go this way. I'm like I really need to let this out um and I find it like really cathartic. Um, my husband has become completely normalized to it. He doesn't even flinch if he sees me just like sitting in there crying. He's like, is this a, a real one or just like, a, we're just doing this? I'm like, we're just doing this. And everything is fine. Um, so I think tapping into your emotion, I would say, um, is a big part of it. Um, like letting your kids do the stuff that they want to do. And I I keep saying kids, obviously, Teddy, the baby isn't asking for screen time or anything like that. But moving past the idea that you become a bad parent if you've let them watch something for the millionth time has been really crucial for me. That I just am like, you know what? I want to be at this dinner. And if she's going to watch Mickey Mouse the whole time and be quiet, that's actually completely fine. Like, no one's life was ruined. She's not going to not get into a great college because she was doing this at this age. And I actually had a, you know, a real kind of heart to heart with her pediatrician about her sleep stuff because they had been giving us all of this advice that just wasn't working. Like, oh, they need more routine or cut the nap back or, you know, it's the ice cream that she had at 4 p.m. or the screens are ruining, uh, are keeping her up, the blue light releases whatever, you know, whatever chemicals. And I came to her and I just said, like, you know where she falls asleep? If she, she falls asleep in bed with us and then we move her, but that's the only thing that's worked. And finally the doctor just backed down and was like, you just have to survive. Like, just let it happen if that's what has to. And she falls asleep between five, five to 10 minutes. She will pass out if she's in our bed. And to know we let her do it. And that's the thing. I think I wish I didn't. For, but... Well, of course. We all wish that it was just perfect and kids just did exactly as you tell them to. But that's just not life. And every child is different. Every circumstance is different. And at the end of the day, you have to do safely, you know, what is best for Totally. Anyone, yeah. No, you no. Know? Yeah. So oh. I – no, I, I appreciate that. And now I'm curious. We talked a little bit about this before, Jessica, but how do you handle – because we're talking about parenting stuff and, you know, I feel like the internet and the world can be so much meaner as soon as you become a parent. <laughs> so how do you handle public scrutiny or opinions about your choices as a mother and a professional? Um. I tend to think that anyone that's being critical about something relating to my kids just hates my politics and they're just using it as a proxy for it. And I would much rather that you just tell me that, you know, Joe Biden was the worst president of your life than tell me that something is like unsafe that I've done with my kid right. or that's not cute or what, you know, whatever it is. Um, yeah. So I'm pretty good at kind of understanding the motivations of people. Um, but I do a lot of internet checking on things. I, I know that the internet is a wild space and you can get a confirmation of anything basically yes. that you're doing. Um, but when I, when something comes up that makes me think, <clears throat> oh, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have done it this way or whatever. I, I do a lot of checking because I'm not on social media. I don't have one of those doctors, you know, everyone's like, oh, well, do you follow like blah, blah, blah. And they're right about all. I don't have any of that. Yeah. I just tend to go with like the Mayo Clinic um, or if something is coming up over and over and over, like if every site is saying that something is normal or mm -hmm. when they're doing this, these are things that you can try. 
I, I go with that. Um, but I don't, I don't take it. And maybe it comes from just like the thick skin of what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. I don't take stuff that personally. I, and I feel like with kids, besides the ones that really just hate Joe Biden, like people are trying to help and they're trying to share and connect. And it is one of these universal things. Like even if you don't have kids yourself, most people have kids that matter to them in their lives, right? They nieces, nephews, whatever it is. And I tend to go with the glass half full perspective on it, that they are trying to make my life easier or better, or just to share something about themselves. And especially with older people and the, you know, the, core demo of cable news is on the older side. Mm -hmm. I think a lot about how much people must be missing a different phase in their lives. You know, if someone who's 75 is telling you about this, like they at one time had this full house, right? And they're thinking back to the times where it's Rouge's mayhem and like there are little butts running all over and someone missed the potty and like, you know, all of the, all the cute stuff. You can tell we're potty training right now that all my examples are around tushies and fecal matter. Um, but <laughs> normal mother. You know, yeah. <laughs> but you can see this affection or or that they're missing something that they yeah. used to have. And so I try to look at it from that perspective. And that makes it kind of just like a warm contribution versus something that I might have taken personally or that would feel harsh. Yeah. Well good for you. And that's so healthy. And well, I, I'm glad that I also said it. that I cry all the time. So <laughs> I can relate. I'm the, I'm yeah. the crier. I just let it out because I agree. It's so it feels so good. Fe I'm oh just God. all about feel your feelings, feel them, all of them, let it mm -hmm. out, you know, because yes, it's healthy. And yeah. now that we're coming to the end of our, our episode, I want to know now, Jessica, like what is one piece of advice you would give to a new mother? Oh, it's, well, great help. Like find, find your system, what, whatever is going to work for you. Um, but take less pictures and live more ah. in it. Like I'm noticing with Teddy, with the second baby that we take less pictures. And some of that is just like Cleo, the older one is around, um, but also second child. Like I've seen it before, right? Like I've seen yes. a really cute little girl before. And like, I'm also not photographing weird things that she's doing to send to my friend who's a doctor and be like, is this normal? You know, whatever. Um, but I feel that I'm living with her in a different way because I'm not behind my phone mm -hmm. all the time. And obviously you want to document things, but there's a richness to the experience that I'm feeling with the second baby from not being as on my phone with her um, that I'm really enjoying. So capture moments, but don't capture every moment, I guess, would be the advice. Because how often are you also going back and looking at it anyway, right? That's true. Like, That's true. <laughs> like you, you frame a few and like move on with your life. So, exactly. um, yeah. So I would take That's less pictures. One. That's Thanks. a good one. Oh my goodness. Jessica. Okay. Do you have just any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our audience with that we need to know how we can follow you? Just all the things. What final thoughts? Oh, um, well, I'm only on X on Twitter and there are very few pictures of my children on there. Um, it's mostly, uh, now just a Kamala Harris Stan account and when I'm going to be on TV. Uh, but uh, yeah, so on Twitter and I don't know, just final thoughts. Like it's so hokey and I, I feel like everyone says it, but just like lean into whatever kind of parent you are or whatever kind of parent you're going to be. Like there are all these kids I, and I look at the stories of, of who people turned out to be like Steve Jobs, right? Like a refugee adopted kid. And he ended up as Steve Jobs. Like it's not, every decision that you're making is not all that serious. And mm -hmm. as long as you love your kids, it turns out pretty well, or that is my hope and kind of my prevailing sentiment. And it was really great to join you. Thank you for having me. 
And yeah, that's kind of it. And you should watch the five. We have a lot of fun. If you're into there, comics. you go. There yeah. you go. Yes, Jessica. Oh my gosh, this was so good. Thank you so much for your time and Thank you. for fabulous. sharing your experiences with all of us. It was just lovely chatting with you and we just genuinely appreciate it. Thank you so much. No, oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. And for our listeners out there to learn more about Jessica, as she said, you can watch her on The Five or follow her on X at Jessica Tarloff. Our team will be posting today's episode on Baby Chick's Facebook and Instagram page at The Baby Chick Chat. So if you have any questions or comments about our discussion, please share them with us in the comment section. And as always, if you haven't already, please subscribe to Chick Chat, The Baby Chick Podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us an honest review. Cheers to navigating motherhood your way.